OK, so maybe we're stuck with Mars. But if you are going to get anywhere, it would be the idea of a wormhole, right? That's right. So this it, is, uh, I don't know why it's called a wormhole rather than a wombat hole. Uh, but the basic idea is to bend space enough that you can pop through here and come out in Alpha Centauri without having to bother going through all those four light years between here and there. Exactly. And, and as you said, this is probably the only conceivable way you can see this, that enough natural energy, so to speak, or, or, or reactions are created to this. And, and there are people who have calculated this. It's famously called the Einstein-Rosen bridge. And that is, if you have some sort of wormhole or a massive object that has created a one of these shortcuts through space, instead of trying to get around, you can just take the shortcut through the tunnel. It's a fairly straightforward idea. Problem solved. As long solved. as you have a black hole. As long as you have a black hole and as long as a black hole does this. And this is kind of the problem that we are just highlighting in the previous video. We don't actually understand at the quantum mechanical level what is happening inside that black hole, right? Yes, I mean, naively, you go into a black hole, you die horribly, and that's the end of it. So... Um, Case closed. <laughs> and that's probably true, uh, but maybe... I mean, we don't really know what happens in black holes. No one's ever going to come out and tell us. That's right. And so a lot of people try and calculate what could happen if you invoke different ideas. And so this is the idea of either, you know, Schwarzfield wormholes, that when you have a solution of a black hole, that in the inside, instead of it being crushed to a horrible, horrible death, that actually you can shortcut through space and pop out in a different way. And you can calculate this if you have relativity. You can calculate what happens if you throw in a mass and it ends up being a shortcut through space, so to speak. Now, there, there's some very... Uh, you are relying on these calculations on yes. either assuming this works perfectly or some grand unified theory. That's so. right, which we don't have. Yes, so... This is not take physics we currently know works. Exactly. This is extrapolate beyond what we currently know and think this might be a future law of physics that if we ever had a wormhole, we might be able to test experimentally. And if it happens to be true, then maybe this could happen. Exactly. So it's nothing like as simple as laws of physics say this will happen, which is often what it comes over in the media. It's not like that. No, that's right. This is, this is, there's a lot of assumptions that go in that think that we even know how to think about doing this. Um, and... And I think this becomes one of these fundamental problems of it's one of those things that, yeah, sure, if it all works out and the math actually does check out down the road and our assumptions about the theories that need to work can solve it. But there's always the practical principle I always highlight is if you genuinely have black holes acting as wormholes and things can come out, where are they coming out? Well, as someone who studies black holes for a living, we actually, it's always been an embarrassment that you see stuff coming out of black holes, you don't see stuff coming in. Most black holes have these jets of particles yep. coming out of the best part of the speed of light. Um, and so we think it's actually not coming from the black hole, right. coming from a disk of stuff around it, but we don't actually know. I mean, so in fact, I'd say, why don't we see things come out of black holes? It's not a very strong argument, because we do see stuff come out of black holes all the time. We think it's actually not come out, it's just come from nearby, Th that's but right. we could well be wrong. That's so right. Maybe they are out there in nature, and there's just something we fu fundamentally fail to understand about what happens in these extreme gravity situations, which would not be surprising, because we don't have these extreme situations in our lab, and we can't measure them. And so, and I think this is kind of where a lot of this work has to be, into actually understanding the extreme nature of black holes and the gravity that happens around it before we can give, be getting it. But I think you raised the interesting problem. How do we actually solve this? If we can't create a black hole on Earth, how do we go about solving, can we travel through a wormhole? I don't know, our best guess might be to look at black holes out there in great detail, things like the Event Horizon Telescope yep. we talk about in the Violet Universe course. Uh, but, but at the moment, the nearest black holes are a long way away, and they're very hard to study in detail. But that might be our best guess, that with future generations of telescope, we can study what happens when black holes merge or things come close to black holes. And that might give us a few clues as to what the laws of physics are like in these weird situations. The trouble is the really important physics for a wormhole is actually inside the event horizon That's of a black right. hole. And no information from there can get out. That's right. So actually, it may well be that no matter, no matter how much we study black holes, we're never going to learn the cool stuff. And... A wormhole that's inside a black hole is going to be fine, but you can never go through it and come out anywhere and then tell us about it. But that doesn't stop people from thinking about it. In fact, a lot of people have wondered, what does it look like? How does it behave? Uh, and could you use it? And so I think this is kind of this interesting idea of, 
yes, wormholes are beautiful. They could be these great shortcuts in space. Maybe they naturally exist. We don't need to create them. Problem solved. But I think this is beyond, it's even beyond a world of science fiction. This is more, it's beyond a world of, of physics that we live in. And, and I don't think we'll probably solve it anytime soon, to be honest. I wouldn't say anytime ever, but uh, I think it may well not be. I like be to be positive, of... Paul. <laughs> but no, but I think you're right. And, and this kind of is a great, I think, ending of when we talk about interstellar travel. It's a nice idea. There's a lot of good practical ideas for what may happen. But when it comes down to it, you either need so much energy, new laws of physics and understanding that just doesn't exist, or potentially parts of the ways that the universe is acting that doesn't exist or we don't know exist, that it probably is unlike that we, that we will ever see humans traveling interstellar space. That's kind of my ultimate I thinking. I mean, my, my angle is a bit different um, because I think, I don't think we're ever going to pass the speed of light. I don't think the sort of wormholes and drives no. are going to work. Agreed. But I actually think that sublight speed travel is actually reasonable simply because, yep. yes, it takes tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years, but these periods are actually very small compared to the time it took to evolve humanity. That's true. I mean, we've had life on Earth for you know, 4 billion years, and the 10 million years to get proximate or Sora is a blink of an eyelid compared to that multiple billions of years. That's right. And so you could imagine our civilization spreading across the galaxy, um, that what happens is, let's say, a 1,000 years from now, we launch a multi-generation ship at a third of the speed of light. I mean, that would bigger the entire world economy to launch it now. But yep. just imagine how much bigger the world economy will be a thousand years from now. Especially after we solve all that asteroid mining and all those other problems we talked about. In this I mean, just election. imagine that some, you asked someone a thousand years ago to build a modern oil tanker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mean, in principle, they could do it with every blacksmith in the world hammering away. Um, so it could well be that the cost of something like this a thousand years in the future will be something kids pay for out of their pocket money. That's right. Uh, if you assume the world's economy keeps growing at a few percent a year for a thousand years, it will be something that you know, school yeah. children are doing for their school projects. That's right. Um, That'd be an interesting science fair project. I would love to be that child, but yes. <laughs> yes, and, and so then it might take 10,000 years to get somewhere, but, but uh, there are certainly, whether it be generation ships or free, cryogenic freezing or something, these are solvable problems. Yep. Or by that point, robots could be much more intelligent than us, so That's we just right. let the robots go and do it. That's true. You can program them not to get bored in the 10,000 years. <laughs> um, and so us or our descendants, the robots or something, in 10,000 years to have a colony on Proxima Centauri, and how long would it take after they land until they have a big civilization then? I mean, in Australia, it took about you know, 100 years from the first settlers arriving to an industrialized civilization. Yep. So maybe after 1,000 years or so to allow for it being a rather more hostile environment than Australia. And Australia's pretty hostile. That's right. Um, you could then have more colony ships that go out from your new place. That's right. And then you start getting exponential growth. That's true. In that case, you could spread through the entire Milky Way galaxy in less than a million years, which is still you know, less than 0.1% of That's the right. age of our solar system. So if you think on human time scales of history or partitions, then yes, it's absolutely impossible. If you're talking about geological yep. time scales or astronomical time scales, easy. So I think it's, I guess, all a matter of perspective then when we're talking about interstellar travel, how easy or hard it is. And whether human civilization will still be around in a thousand years and is stable enough to launch something <laughs> that will last that long, as opposed to most current politicians who seem to have trouble thinking past the next election. So, well, I think that's a great way of pointing out interstellar travel really relies on the idea of an intersection of what it almost means to be human and how we treat these problems, whether we can think long term or we're only going to keep focus on the short term.